Well, uh, I'm going to present uh, decolonizing design research towards the pluriverse, some um, reflections that I'm having, especially because of my engagement with this concept through uh, the events and uh, the conversations, the great conversations that Leslie Ann Noel is organizing uh, around the world. And I hope that she will better explain <laughs> Uh, and better take the practical aspects of uh, pluriversal design. I'm going to much more focused on what can we do uh, with this concept uh, in places like Brazil and other places from the global south or uh, former colonies and so on. My positionality in this discussion is of uh, a white uh, cis man uh, working in Brazil. So usually I have a quite some privileges in Brazil, but I usually when I'm joining these kind of international events and when I was even doing my PhD in the Netherlands, I was not really having so many privileges. My position was not as a white man. I was uh, perceived as a Latino person, perhaps less rational sometimes. I got angry on that. <laughs> and then I, since I came back to Brazil, I started studying decolonizing uh, the colonial literature. My current position in the university is on service design, experience design. So I try to bring this uh, decolonial lens uh, to this area. And I would start with a few words in Portuguese because we are uh, hosting this conference in Brazil. A realidade brasileira também é uma realidade universal. Todos os brasileiros e brasileiras podem também ver coisas e descobrir coisas que servem ao resto do mundo. Não precisamos nos sentir menos do que os outros pesquisadores em outros lugares. I'm sorry if you don't understand Portuguese, but what I was telling my fellow colleagues who understand Portuguese is that what happens in Brazil is also an universal. It's not just something uh, interesting for the Brazilians themselves. For example, right now we have this uh, water crisis uh, uh, because of many reasons, uh, climate change, but also deforestation in the savanna area in Brazil, the Cerrados. And the Paraná River, which is one of the biggest, and that um, flows, well, the water flows through entire South America, and this river is just almost uh, nothing. It's not really, really small. It's really one of the toughest water crises in our history. And this is not just happening in Brazil. And if we focus on doing research on sustainable design in Brazil, on water crisis in Brazil, uh, decolonizing design in Brazil, we miss the point. <laughs> the point is, if we are fighting a colonial universal, we have to find our own universes to, uh, uh, com to um, contrast with them. And what I'm proposing with this uh, short presentation is to reframe the environmental crisis in Brazil and other places as an existential crisis for both women, human, and other than human beings. Existential threats, they are usually not distributed evenly. Some beings are more human than others. And by that, I just don't mean <laughs> homo sapiens. Uh, dogs and cats are very human. And sometimes dogs and cats in a privileged uh, place, in a privileged country, they get more investment, more money, more resources than homo sapiens living in other places of the world. But also uh, there's disparities and even larger ones regarding uh, vegetables, regarding other kinds of animals. And as, as long as they are not considered part of this human culture, a specific one, because the other ones are not considered humans, they are threatened. And for example, take a look at how the, of the unequal distribution of the COVID-19 vaccines uh, across the world and see that, for example, in Africa and parts of, large parts of Asia and even in uh, Latin America, uh, the vaccines are not coming uh, as soon as, as, as quick as they came, for example, to places that are, uh, have the ideal uh, concept of humanity um, being developed and spread to the entire world. So the ones who uh, deserve to, <laughs> to live, to exist in these situations, uh, are only the ones who have accumulated resources uh, for long centuries and you know, through unequal exchanges, uh, they, are, they can say, well, we have the money, right? So we can 
purchase the vaccines. But that's not entirely fair if you consider that uh, money is just a recent uh, invention uh, to, to take such a decisions in a history of humanity. If you take a long perspective, that's totally unfair. Well, so far, design research has addressed the environmental crisis, mostly by finding ways to reduce, reuse, and recycle resources. Well, if there is already a critical uh, sustainable design discourse that shows that uh, reducing consumption will not resolve the, uh, the environmental crisis, much to speak of the existential crisis. To address those existential crises, well, I would see, I would suggest that design research faces the historical contradictions that are behind them. Taking this long perspective and considering uh, what has been neglected and what is the tensions that are accumulating in our societies, and we usually don't want to address them. The existential crisis, for example, um, we can trace them to the contradictions harbored by the modernity existential project. Well, there are many ways of talking about these things. People would say it's the Illuminism, people would tell it's the just colonialism, it's just imperialism, it's capitalism, racism. But I, I would like to uh, join all of them together under a single concept, which is modernity. But I want to qualify what the modernity is, because a lot of people criticize modern world and now modernity. Uh, I believe modernity is an existential project. So it means that modernity is a way of existing in the world and trying to exist in the future, keeping your existence, sustaining your existence. And it's a collective uh, existential project. However, this existential project consists of realizing an universal way of being human, the specific one, the white, Western, North Atlantic, European anthropos. Today, people say, uh, especially in sustainable design discourses, that we live in an anthropocentric world. And we, uh, uh, we came to the age where the human kind is the most, the strongest uh, uh, force uh, shaping the earth. And therefore, they call it Anthropocene. I wouldn't say so, because if every human being was considered to be a human, and uh, then we could say that we live in an anthropocentric world. What we live now it is an Euro Eurocentric world or perhaps North Atlantic centric world because there are some United States also very heavily uh, rely on these kind of uh, universalities to um, uh, place them, their position in the world so that they can continue keep accumulating privileges in this way. Uh, this reflects modernity project and this universal notion of the human being has a profound effect on modern culture and especially modern art, modern design. Uh, here I just picked up two uh, pictures of uh, an ideal man. And, and I'm, I'm really speaking about the ideal man because it's a man, it's, it's a male human, right? And, and even though, uh, 500 years have passed from one picture to the other one, one by Leonardo da Vinci, the second by Le Corbusier. It's still the same kind of uh, man and why man, as I said, it, it's an universal. And this is, is taken by design research and art and many other fields as a kind of uh, a standard for designing um, and taking decisions about which kind of functions and uh, forms should fit those humans. So this is perhaps the positive aspect of this um, existential project. The bad aspect, the nasty aspect, is that to realize that universality, you need to erase, you need to ignore, you need to downgrade other ways of being humans because they're not, they are not ideal. They are less than ideal. They are not as developed as this one. So this existential, modernity existential project subsumes other co collective existential projects and colonialism, racism, the way the indigenous people, they were hunted or they were enslaved, and especially the, uh, those uh, coming from Africa. Uh, African people, they just were uh, immig forced immigrants and they have to face harsh, really, really harsh living conditions. Their existence were uh, put at stake all the time. 
as if they were just objects or instruments to realizing that modernity existential project. Their nations, their ideas about what a human being is like, and their, especially those, their, their relation to nature was totally ignored, as if it didn't matter. And through colonialism, this allegedly superior existential project justify the unfair exchange with the allegedly inferior existential projects uh, in other places of the world. So colonialism was key to this existential project to extend modernity uh, and also while extending, uh, replacing existing uh, existential projects. So it's hard to, um, for example, recover and the history that has been erased through this process. Colonialism brought not just impact on the human cultures, but also animal extinction, deforestation, desertification, pollution to worlds where this has never happened before. Of course, this have, has happened before in Europe. For example, deforestation uh, was really building up on the centuries before colonization. And can also be attributed as one of the reasons that impelled the motivation that impelled the uh, uh, Europeans uh, to find new worlds, to extract and accumulate resources and transform them into wealth. Uh, in colonization, colonies, they had to develop quickly, but that development was never uh, the same level of the metropolis, never reached because the metropolis was gaining benefits from that development. It was assisted development. But in fact, those who were really assisted were metropolises. They enriched much more than the colonies and and uh, most of the environmental damage has happened in the colonies, not in the metropolises. So this uh, colonization created opportunity for the emergence, emergence of capitalism and other systems of oppression. And so it, it, that's why it's so important if you want to address an existential crisis to go back to colonization because uh, the threats, for example, to, uh, towards black people right now that uh, black Lives Matter is raising to the entire world, has its historical roots on colonialism. We cannot deny that. And what happened in the first years of colonialism, especially when regarding the resources extracted from Brazil, it was accumulated in Portugal and, and, and Spain. They had this primitive accumulation of capital, which didn't return back into new investments, at least not the biggest part. And therefore, later on, uh, other nations uh, they took this money, this gold, and they transformed it into a means of production, and they delivered back products, and that's where industrial revolution started. So a lot of uh, other uh, historical important facts stems from colonization. If you say that industrial design comes from <laughs> industrial revolution, then uh, industrial design also comes from colonialism. Modern colonialism might be almost over by now, but traces of coloniality can still be found in power, knowledge, and ontological relations. There is this Latin American uh, group of researchers called modernity slash coloniality that has done an marvelous work on denouncing the colonization that is still with us, but in the shape of uh, more subtle relations, like the way we uh, relate in, uh, in, in institutions, how we relate in university, and also how we relate to ourselves, the way we believe that we are in the world, the ontological relations. Uh, well, design, um, as I said, is already pretty much bounded to the history of colonization, but design is also still bounded to this recent re history of coloniality. And I would say that design is specific, uh, implicated in, a, in a production relations and the coloniality of making that is reproduced through this international division of production relations. I am developing this concept from the Brazilian philosopher Álvaro Vieira Pinto, who is not so well known even in Brazil, but uh, most people know Paulo Freire, who was a collaborator of him, and that Paulo Freire also said that uh, Vieira Pinto was his master in terms of philosophical ideas, concepts like conscientization, stems from the work of Alvaro Vera Pinto. But he also has an interesting remarks about design and about uh, making that uh, is totally overlooked. 
because of the coloniality of knowledge, of believing that the knowledge produced elsewhere outside of Brazil is more important than the knowledge produced already in Brazil. However, I'm going to add this now, coloniality of baking with the uh, recent insights that I got from this reading of the concept of technology, the Alvaro Vira Pinto's major work. So he says that coloniality of making prioritized the developed nations' intellectual labor over the underdeveloped nations' manual labor. So there is this uh, international geopolitical relations. Developed nations design and theorize design, and the developed nations just make, they don't design. Or they merely practice design if they do design. Or they don't even have design at all. Design is just something that happens from the outside. And the implications that, that is that design researchers in countries like Brazil feel they are not good enough or do not have the time to interpret their reality in their own terms. Therefore, they prefer instead to rely on foreign theories and methods, like, for example, the human-centered design toolkit, which uh, has been developed to help to assist uh, to develop the underdeveloped or the developing nations, as they would call them. But instead, it just created a dependence, a theoretical dependence, a methodological dependence that affects heavily the autonomy of design students, but also of um, entrepreneurs, uh, of communities that are trying to figure out and make sense of their conditions for living and finding those existential threats and try to overcome them with the, what they already have in their place. This human-centered design toolkit does not help so much because it brings uh, uh, knowledge from the outside, a knowledge that is considered to be superior to the existing local knowledge. Well, despite this divide, there is a radical movement that questions the implication of designing all forms of coloniality while seeking alternative theories and practice of design. I'm speaking about the decolonizing design movement that seeks to acknowledge, dismantle, repair, and compensate for what the colonized have lost in past exchanges. Uh, decolonizing design supports pre-modern, outer-modern, post-modern, and anti-modern existential projects. Well, there's a plenty, many uh, burgeoning authors that usually have originated from Global South, like uh, uh, Tristan Schuss, uh, like Pedro Oliveira, like uh, Luisa Prado, like many people who formed this nice decolonized design group, but they are now in the Global North. But also, also people working with this, under this rubric of this decolonized design in Global South, yep. like I am in Brazil. And we are trying to um, question uh, the modernity and try to find other ways before modernity, after modernity, and outer modernity. The concept of the pluriverse has become an influential utopia in this decolonized design movement, uh, stating on how these different existential projects might coexist. Uh, a major book has been published in 2018 by Artur Escobar, an anthropologist who got interested on design studies. And um, he uh, wrote something really interesting that tried to join together those different literature spread through Latin America, but also place, other places in the global south. And it has since become, a, as I said, an inspiration for uh, joining together people who are interested on decolonizing. But also, some people would prefer to use the concept of, of pluriverse instead of decolonizing because they feel like we can get to the point easily. Well, let, let me see what I think about using this concept. Uh, usually, Arturo Escobar would define what a pluriverse is based on this um, uh, motto, this uh, saying of the Zapatista, uh, liberation fighters uh, of the Caribbean. They said, we could live in a world that can fit many worlds. So we don't need to um, exterminate other worlds through war. So we can have some, some kind of peaceful war that liberates people without excluding the other ones. But a lot of people forget about the Zapatista history, especially that they went through war, really. But it was a very different kind of war. Um, and they would say pluriverse is just the opposite of universe. So let's forget about everything that comes through colonialities and just stick to what we already have in our localities. And some people would 
take this concept of the pluriverse into practice as focusing on each of our uh, community, local community. So we couldn't live in a world where there are multiple local communities and they're each doing their own thing, their own way. So we don't need to interfere much with each other. I think this is going towards a, a, a not very good direction, I would say. If you interpret the pluriverse in this way, you might come back reproducing some strategies that have been used to um, prevent the colonial movements from growing and presenting some radical uh, structural changes in society. For example, on the left side, I show the melting pot uh, uh, theory of how cultures could mingle together and become just one big nations in the United States and a similar um, movement that happened in Brazil um, in the 20th century, the whitening of the black and indigenous communities through this uh, state uh, stimulated um, hybridisms and, and, and uh, mestizaging so that these cultures, the, uh, the black culture, indigenous cultures and the several other minority cu cultures, they, they lost the space. Uh, they felt like they could not really uh, fight what has been um, colonized in the past. They couldn't ask, ask for reparation because this was considered to be a living utopia. <laughs> I would like to rephrase the pluriverse as an universe that can afford several conflicting universes. If we keep this uh, possibility of fighting back, of uh, questioning, of not, have, not having settled the colonization, then we can have an interesting utopia. Going hyper-local and reject universes, I wouldn't say it favors the decolonization struggle. Instead, it favors the colonialist argument for the civilized, the underdeveloped. They say they don't have universities. They don't know anything. They have no knowledge. Therefore, we have to impart knowledge on them. We have to put knowledge on them. If they don't have universities, they need because they need to survive in a globalized world uh, and so on. So we need to fight uh, universalities uh, with other universalities. We cannot fight with particularities. Design research can help us uh, universalizing Southern particulars. And now I'm taking Southern not in a geographical way because in Brazil, the South is richer and colonizer and the North is uh, weaker and, and colonized usually. So, but the North is um, epistemologically the South of Brazil. The geographical North is the South of Brazil because it has been neglected in our history. And then, but we can look at this South and find what is universal uh, in that particularity that can be useful for other places that have been neglected to in the past. The South has plenty of designs by other names as uh, uh, Alfredo Gutierrez Borrero states, a Colombian researcher uh, who created this concept of equi alter valente to uh, relate what we call as design to something that is not called design, is not recognized as design, it doesn't even want to be called design, but plays a similar role in different cultures. So we can respect that they already have a way of making, a way of producing their existence. And then we can relate those uh, concepts to uh, northern designs, not the ways of doing design, colonialist, the ways of doing design. And I would add to uh, Borrero's understanding that this can be also equi alter potent against uh, the colonization. And Borrero has written extensively on Suma Kausai, Mingas, Ubuntu, Hind Swaraj, Yugat, Gambiarra, Anthropophagy. Well, I also, also wrote a little bit about it. And I find there you can find a lot of inspiration for doing design a different way. Instead of being included in design research as modernity fixes, I think they should be included them as modernity resistance. Uh, every design research is part of collective existential project, community, institution, university, nation, a world that can sustain specific beings. If we scrutinize the collective existential projects that we contribute to our research, we can address this existential crisis in different way. So the main, main, main questions to uh, as a takeaway for you is to ask whose existence is at stake with this project? What are the qualities of that existence? 
Well, I'm investigating a lot of different projects. The Corais platform has more than 700 that we developed in the last 10 years. I won't talk about them right now. You can check my website if you want to get more acquainted with them. I just want to say that in this revised version of the Pluriverse, these inclusive existential projects of the South, they can fight and dismantle the exclusive existential projects of the North. It seems hard until we realize that decolonizing can join forces with depatriarchizing, decapitalizing, abolishing, declassifying, unsettling, and other counter-hegemonic efforts. So thank you very much, muito obrigado. And I'm curious to listen to Leslie Ann and uh, questions later on. Thank you.